He served in the 108th District, representing Northumberland and Montour counties from 1967 to 1972 in the House of Representatives. Good morning. Good morning, Heidi. I wanted to begin by asking you um, about your childhood and your early family life. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, my grandparents uh, came to the United States from Poland and settled in Shenandoah about 1908 through 1910. My father and mother were born there in 1910 and 1912, and during the Depression, when the coal industry collapsed and they, they, there was a great unemployment in Schuylkill County, my father and mother came to Sunbury, which is in the county seat of Northumberland County, where my father opened a shoe repair business. So my, uh, and I was born and raised in Sun. I was born in 1936 in Sunbury, and I have, I had uh, five, uh, four brothers and a sister, and uh, they were all born there. We were born and raised in Sunbury, and I graduated from Sunbury High School in 1954. I went away to Trinity College in Connecticut in 19, I graduated there in 1958. And then I went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School in Philadelphia where I graduated in 1966, or it should be 1961. So that's basically my. Was anybody in your family involved in politics? My father was very involved in politics. My father was the Democratic chairman of Sunbury and he ran for a public office a number of times and never made it. He ran twice for the State House of Representatives and was defeated both times. But he was the one, I'd say, most got me involved in politics. Uh, when I was in high school, I took touch typing in the secretarial class because I was going away to college and needed to know how to type. Well, my, but my father put me to work as his secretary, quote unquote, to help him with press releases and letters for the Democratic uh, Committee of Sunbury. So I used my typing for that, and that kind of got me into the political situation. So was your family always Democrat? Yes. In Sunbury, we certainly were, yes. Um, did you even give it any other thoughts um, of becoming a Republican or anything? Well, no. Because of our family background and the Depression, mm -hmm. uh, my father and mother were great uh, admirers of Franklin Roosevelt. In fact, I was named after President Roosevelt. He made a speech in Sunbury in 1936, about two weeks after I was born. And that was, my father decided then there to name me Franklin, and that's how I got Franklin. But they, they, my father always believed that Roosevelt's, what he did during the Depression and the New Deal saved America, and he, so that made a great Democrat out of him, and we never changed from that. What kind of Democrat were you? Well, I don't know what you mean, what kind. We were, we were good Democrats, we were active in the party. My father was a party leader, and I was a, a candidate and a six office holder for the Democratic Party. So we remained pretty good Democrats, although you know, now I occasionally split my ticket. I don't let the party think for me, but uh, generally, if, if there's any doubt, I give the benefit of it to the Democrats. Okay. Could you describe your career before coming to the House? Well, when I left uh, law school, I went to work in the Attorney General's office here in Harrisburg. David Stahl was the Attorney General under Governor Lawrence, and I did a lot of work here. I got to help. In fact, one of the things I did, I was assigned to do research for Democratic legislators. I remember doing some research on the landlord-tenant law for Representative Toll from Philadelphia, uh, and uh, I also did some constitutional research for a Representative uh, John Gailey from York County. I did that kind of work for House Democrats as part of my work in the Attorney General's office. So I got some acquaintance with the legislature and uh, also before I went to law school, or before I graduated, I worked for the Sunbury Daily Item as a political reporter in the summers, between my second and third year in law school. And I interviewed the legislators every week and wrote stories on the legislature. So I had all of that. I also worked briefly for Congressman George Rhodes and learned a lot about he, how he ran his congressional office. And then when uh, I went in the Army in 1962, and I came back in 63 and went up to Sunbury with my new wife, Elizabeth Beth, and we settled down, and uh, I got involved with Bassie Beck, who was a great conservation leader at that time. He was the North Central Chairman of the Pennsylvania Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs, and I became his secretary. Well, he did a lot of work on the Clean Streams Law, and uh, when they, they passed the Clean Streams Law in 1965, 
which brought the coal companies under the Clean Streams Law completely for the first time in history. They had always been exempt because of their political power here in Harrisburg. And the incumbent, uh, Adam Bauer, was one of six who voted against that bill to bring the coal companies under the Clean Streams Act. And Bassie Beck and I talked it over, and we decided I would run for the House, and he would head my campaign. And that's how I got into the race. Um, so you ran against Adam Bauer. How old were you at the time? I was, in 1966, I was 30 years old. That's quite a challenge because he had been here for almost 30 years. Yeah, he was, uh, he was, had 14 terms. He was elected uh, when I was two years old. And he was a senior Republican in the House. He was the Republican caucus chairman. I think he was the Republican appropriations chairman. What kind of campaign was it? Well, in, in Northumberland County in those days, the politics was dominated by the Lark Republican organization which was run by Henry Lark, which is a very well-disciplined organization based on patronage. And he had a system where people who worked for the county or the state all contributed to the party as part of their job. He, 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 he raised a lot of money that way, and he always took care of the nominating petitions and the d details for his candidates. And he, he took care of the advertising, and he always wound up his campaigns with a sharp attack on the Democrats. He, he, promulgated the idea that a straight vote is the only safe vote. If you split your ticket, you're going to lose your vote. And it was a pretty tough organization, which, been, which had been in power for some time. Uh, that's what I had to run against. So I decided to do a number of things to challenge it. First of all, I got good literature together. I, I went to Bacharach in Philadelphia for my photograph. We got good pictures. Secondly, we, we developed an issue. The issue was clean streams. What are we going to do to clean up our river to stop the fish kills? Well, fortunately for me, unfortunately for the people of the, or for the river and for Mr. Bauer, there was a fish kill that summer. A slug of acid went down the west branch of the river and killed a lot of fish. So I had a, an issue handed to me on a platter, and I never let up on that. We have to clean this up. So I got a good message, clean up the river. I would do it. He voted against it. He couldn't do it. Uh, we got the, a lot of help. I got, I got a lot of volunteers. The Sunbury Democratic Women's Club and other organizations came in to volunteer to get my mailings out. We got a mailing out. We got two mailings out to every voter in the 108th District, and the ladies donated generously of their time to hand address to every one of those envelopes. At that time, you didn't have the kind of technology you do now. We all hand addressed envelopes. We had good message. We got it out to everybody. Uh, my wife and I knocked on a lot of doors. We laid out a plan for visiting every precinct in the district in proportion to the number of votes in that precinct. For example, I, th I think our, t our, uh, our module was a 2,000-vote precinct. Now, there aren't many of them in, in that district. But if, you, if, the, if there were 500 people in that district, then we'd spend one quarter, we'd spend half a day there. If there was uh, 1,000, we'd spend the whole day there. You know, we'd, we had it, so we spent our time where the votes were. Uh, we knocked on an awful lot of doors. Uh, we started in July and our, in August. We, had a, we also had a questionnaire we gave out to people. Uh, the Lark organization never asked people. They always told them what was the good for them, and we thought we'd ask people. So I passed that questionnaire personally. We mailed a lot out, and we publicized that I was seeking public opinion. That helped a great deal. The other thing we did, which I think was maybe the single best in stroke of luck or insight I had was, there was a, a Democrat was elected district attorney of Montour County. His name was Dick Britton. He was a good friend of mine. And Dick went on the radio with an ad, which we wrote for him, which told people that a split ticket was just as valid as a straight ticket. In fact, it was a crime not to count a split ticket. And you could vote for Franklin Curry and vote Republican, and still your vote would be 100% counted. And he did that ad, which we played a lot. I think that helped break down the idea that you had to have only a straight vote. You could only vote a straight ticket to win, or to be, have your vote counted. So with all of that and an awful lot of hard work knocking on doors and phone calls and the, uh, and, and the, uh, and the literature and the message, we won. It, I won by 1,000 votes, almost uh, 900 votes. I ran 5,000 votes ahead of Governor Schapp, who was running at that time. He didn't win. Schaefer won. 
but uh, Schaefer won uh, the district by almost 5,000, and I won by 900. So I, it, was, it was quite a story. What was your relationship with um, Adam Bauer? Well, strangely enough, I never met Mr. Bauer before the election. And after the election, he was named chief clerk of the House by the Republicans because they still control the House. I was in a minority. When he came to Har we came to Harrisburg. I thought he would be holding it against me that I beat him, but he didn't. He was very nice about it. He was very gracious. In fact, on at least one occasion, he called me into his office and gave me information about what was going on that my own party didn't tell me about, and which I should have known. So he was very gracious, and uh, I was great. great. I, I tried to be as, as nice to him as he was to me. Uh, he died uh, four or five years ago. I forget how long it's been since he died. But a few years ago, they dedicated a Faber Dam in Sunbury in his name, and Representative Merle Phillips asked me to speak, and I did, and I was very pleased to speak and to name the dam after Adam Bauer. And uh, it proves that in politics, uh, you can be opponents, but it doesn't mean you have to be an enemy, and I never looked at him that way. I thought he was a fine gentleman, and I have a highest regard for him. Could you tell me a little bit about the 108th District? Well, the biggest municipality in the 108th District is the city of Sunbury, which is a city of the third class. There were a number of other municipalities, but they're all boroughs. The borough of Danville was there, Riverside, uh, the borough of Northumberland, the borough of Milton, Watsontown, Washingtonville and I think as far down as Herndon. And it was a, basically, it was a large rural area, a lot of farmers in it. And the towns were basically small mercantile towns. There was a little bit of industry. In Danville, of course, the biggest thing was the Geisinger. They dominate the, the town. In Sunbury, we had the, uh, at that time, we had the silk mill and uh, some other things like that. Uh, the, uh, in, in, uh, in Milton, there were two steel factories, small, very small, but they had steel factories. And in Watsontown, they had uh, uh, a television company, so a manufacturer. But it was basically, it wasn't really heavy industry except for small pieces of it. But basically rural and commercial. Were the people registered Republican or Democrat? It was basically a Republican district. I think it was about 60-40 Republican. A Democrat hadn't won that House seat since the Roosevelt landslide. Mm -hmm. So it was basically Republican, and the Lark organization pretty well dominated. They controlled the candidates. How has the district changed through time? Do you well, still live in the district? No, I don't. I left the district in 1986. Okay. I was offered an opportunity to become a partner at a big law firm, one of Pennsylvania's major law firms, Reed Smith, which I did, and that required me to move to Harrisburg. And I was out of politics anyhow, so it was one of those things. I just, my wife and I moved down here in 1986. Did you see great change in the district then? I don't see great change. I think some of the industry has been lost. Uh, I see it more the, the malls are bigger and bigger, and the downtown businesses are decl have, have declined a lot. Some of the industries have gone out of business, but uh, I think uh, yeah, I, I Chef Boyardee and Milton, I'm not sure that's still there. I know the, uh, the, uh, uh, the television station or the television factory that it produced. The television sets in Watsontown has been closed. But I think that the industry is, is, is declined. It's more small business. The Geisinger are still thriving. But other than that, it, it's, it really hasn't changed greatly. How did you feel after being elected to the House of Representatives? Well, I felt exalted. My father had run twice for this against Mr. Bauer and lost. Uh, we put our heart and soul into it, and it was very satisfying to get that kind of response from the public that, that we did. To have 5,000 people or, uh, vote for Schaefer and also vote for me it was a great, uh, it was a great, uh, great thing. Once you arrived on the Hill, did anything surprise you? Well, I think the caucus system surprised me. I had no idea how strong that was. And I learned an awful lot about Philadelphia in a hurry. <laughs> so, a, lot of, a lot of the Democrats were from Philadelphia. And the party leader, Herb Feynman, was from Philadelphia. Of course, Leroy Irvis was from Pittsburgh, and I learned a lot about Allegheny. But in Democratic caucuses, I learned a great deal. Did you have any mentors when you first started? Uh, Bassie Beck, to some extent, was a very great, very great help uh, up the river, particularly on environmental issues. Mm -hmm. 
he, he chaired my campaign, and he went on a Radio 2 ad about why they should vote for me, because he saw Bauer cast a negative vote on the Clean Streams bill, and he urged people to vote for me. He was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Here in Harrisburg, I think Leroy Erbus was, was my mentor. Uh, nobody in Harrisburg paid any attention to me when I was a candidate prior to winning, except Leroy Irvis. He called me on the telephone in July when I was running and asked me to come out and have dinner with him, which I did. And he did just me and him for dinner, and he gave me some advice on how to run the election, things to do, and he told me a lot about Bauer and Harrisburg and what to look for, what, what to avoid doing and saying, and what to say, and he was very helpful. So uh, when I was elected, I felt a great deal of uh, respect and gratitude to Roy Irvis, particularly. Did you work closely with anyone while you were here? Well, I worked with a lot of people. I tried to work with the House leadership. I mean, I could not do as a, uh, automatically what the leadership wanted because I came from a Republican district. So I just couldn't do whatever Herb Feynman or Irvis or anybody else said, this is the Democratic position. I had to look at, at it pretty carefully to determine how it helped my district. And sometimes I had a split for the party, but I always told the leadership where I was, so I didn't surprise them on the floor. That's the one thing the party leadership does not want is you thinking they've got your vote, they go on, you go on the floor and then you vote the opposite way or speak against them. I never did that. I always, if I had a problem with what they wanted, I told them. For example, Herb Feynman had a bill to require the registration of rifles and shotguns. Well, in my district, that just wouldn't, he, just, that was just a, a simple no vote, and I told him that. So he knew that up front. I wouldn't surprise him. When you account, recount your experience in the House, did you have any favorite stories? Well, there's a lot of stories. I, I can't, I had no particular favorite story. I mean, I have a lot of good stories about the House. Okay. Um, what was the hardest issue that you ever faced as a representative? Well, I think voting for taxes under Governor Schaap. I never forget we voted for a tax to raise uh, money by putting a, a tax on insurance, pro or insurance premiums. And the Democratic and Republican leaders of the House agreed to it. This was the one time they stopped fighting and agreed this is the way to ra close our balance, or balance our budget. And it was a, a tax on insurance premiums. And the storm that hit that was furious. We voted for it and three weeks later we repealed it. That was a tough one. But I went on the radio and I talked about it. I listened to people and I voted. I haven't voted for it. I haven't voted to repeal it. But uh, I think we handled it well. But it was a generally bipartisan effort to try to solve the budget problem. Because mm -hmm. as people know, in Pen Pennsylvania, unlike Congress, you've got to balance the budget. You can't spend what you don't have. There's no deficit spending in Pennsylvania for operational purposes, only for capital purposes. <laughs> so. You attempted to pass an amendment to, um, it was in House Bill 509 in 1969, that would set term limits of four years for both House members and Senate members. Yeah. <laughs> what is your opinion of term limits now? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I have a great question about whether people should be here too long. Uh, there are people who have stayed here quite a while and make quite a contribution, but on the other hand, if you stay here too long, I think sometimes you get away from why you're here. You're, I never came to the Capitol with the idea of making a career of being a legislator. There are certain things I wanted to get done, and when they were done, I thought it was time for me to leave, and I left voluntarily. I'd, I had my own self-imposed term limits. I had three terms in the House and two in the Senate. I figured that was long enough. Uh, I'd probably not be for term limits now, but I think we ought to do more to keep it so that people do not look on this as a, as a career, but as an opportunity to serve and then move on. Mm -hmm. Article 1, Section 27 yeah. of the Pennsylvania Constitution was quite a great achievement for a legislator. Well, yes, I, as I look back on my legislative career, I think that's the thing in which I take the most pride. Uh, could you first describe the process of getting th the Constitution amended? Well, for, yeah, let me tell you first how I got the idea of doing this. And my friend, strangely enough, my, the, the greatest idea I, I think I ever had in the House came to me, or in the legislature of 14 years, was as, as a freshman representative. I was reading the New York Times one in the fall of 1968 when I was running for re-election. 
I saw that the New York people were about to enact an amendment to the New York environmental uh, con uh, amendment to the New York Constitution. And suddenly it hit me: Why doesn't Pennsylvania have something like that? Uh, we can pass a lot of bills, and we were passing a lot of environmental bills. But legislatures come and go, and they can repeal and pass anything. And what's passed today can be repealed tomorrow. So it occurred to me we need a constitutional amendment to guarantee certain things. So we overturned this past century of exploitation of our natural resources by the coal companies and the steel companies and the railroad companies. We really ravished our state uh, of their natural resources and left us with all these acres and acres of mine land that's abandoned and scarred and with dirty water like in Shemokin Creek that was absolutely been polluted for a century. So I came up with the idea, but, but the New York Constitutional Amendment was too detailed. So I thought we ought to have a simple, basic uh, statement of broad general principles. This is where my experience as a lawyer, as a politician came together, and a historian came together because I used my constitutional law training from Penn Law School. I used my knowledge of Pennsylvania history. When I was in Northumberland County, I, was, I did a lot of uh, legal work searching titles. And I'll never forget searching a title in Coltmont, Pennsylvania. And I found a deed from the Pottsville and Reading Railroad Company to Monroe Culp, who founded the borough of Coltmont, which is just east of Shemokin. In that deed, the coal company reserved the right forever to discharge into the waters of Shemokin Creek its pollution, its dirt, its refuge, and its waste. I thought that was outrageous. I thought that should be made invalid by constitutionally. So that and my knowledge of constitutional law, my political, well, let's get the amendment together. So we drafted an amendment which basically said that the people, that the public natural resources of Pennsylvania belong to all generations of Pennsylvania, and that the people of Pennsylvania have certain basic rights in a clean environment, and clean water, clean air, and the historic values of the environment. And I then said, the, most, the next sentence was that the, Pencil, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania shall act as a trustee of these rights for the people of Pennsylvania. So what we did then, we drafted a bill. I got a lot of co-sponsors and I introduced it. Just like a regular bill, you have to introduce it. Then it has to go through the House and the Senate for one session. Then the next session, it's got to be reintroduced and go through in exactly the same form as it passed the first house. Now in the first go around, you can, add a, uh, you can make amendments, but the second session, you can't take amendments. So in the first session, we got, I never forget, we had a meeting with Herb Feynman and Leroy Irvis and John Ladadia, who was a very active conservation leader. In fact, he was chairman of the committee. He was the outstanding environmental leader in Pennsylvania and the, and the House of Representatives. At that. He was chairman of the committee, and I was secretary of the committee. The four of us had a meeting. And we worked out some amendments to the bill. Feynman, for example, was concerned that one of the phrases, in their natural state, would preclude uh, urban renewal projects in Philadelphia. So he wanted to take that word natural out. Well, I, I agreed to that. There were some other t things like that. We, t we tweaked it. It went to the Senate, and Dr. Goddard wanted to make a change or two, so we tweaked it. But it passed both the House and the Senate. And then in the next session, the 71-72 uh, uh, session, or you know, 70 or 71, we passed it again. And then it had to go on the ballot to be approved by the voters. And there were five or six amendments on the ballot that year, in that primary. Uh, two or three of them were defeated, but the, my environmental amendment won, oh, hands down, two or three to one. The rest of them were much closer and two were defeated, but this one won because the people of Pennsylvania really were ready for this. They wanted it and they got it. And I feel very good about it. Was there any opposition in the House or the Senate to this? Not as such. There was, I think most people realize the environmental tide was very strong, and I don't think anybody wanted to be perceived as being against these broad principles. Uh, there were some tweaks in it and some changes, but I don't think there was any outright opposition. I think we, we caught the tide when it was rising, and I think that's important in politics. You've got to know when the tide, which way the tide's going with, and what boat you want to sail on. We had the right boat and the right tide, and we sailed, and I felt very good about it. Were there other pieces of environmental legislation at this time that were being introduced? Oh, sure. In the six years I was in the House, we passed more environmental legislation than in all of the Pennsylvania history prior to that time and or since, I think. 
we passed, uh, for example, uh, a major rewriting of the Clean Streams Bill, which was the reason I was elected. I campaigned I would be for a stronger, much tougher Clean Streams Law. We did that. We passed a bill to create the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we passed a Scenic Rivers Bill, which I was the chief sponsor of, to model after the federal law. We did, this, we did the Clean Air Bill. We did a Solid Waste Management Bill. We did a lot of, we, we did a $500 million bond issue. So we passed six or seven major pieces of environmental legislation in those six years and while I was on the uh, Environmental Committee as Secretary. Why did um, the environmental um, tide turn, so to speak? You mean, you mean why it suddenly came out of the past? Yeah. Well, I think television had a lot to do with it. People, television, people be, enabled people to see what was going on. They saw the, I think in California there was a lot of uh, whales or wildlife was killed on the shores because of the oil spills in California. And people could see that uh, on their television sets in their home. And then began to see more and more of the things, of the, the eyesores around Pennsylvania, the acres of abandoned coal mine in Northumberland, Schuylkill, and Carbon, and Luzerne counties. People began to be, become aware of that, began to aware how badly polluted Shimokin Creek was and a lot of other creeks like that. So I think the whole thing just kind of hit. And we got this Earth Day movement. And I think with te television had a lot to do with it. Just like television had a lot to do with the Civil Rights Movement. When Martin Luther King went to Alabama, and the sheriffs and the dogs beat him up. It was on national television, and people were outraged, as they should have been. But they saw it. It wasn't something they could keep quiet in the South. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't keep quiet about environmental problems anymore either. There and was, that helped it. I'm sorry. There was a connection with Earth Day and the legislation, wasn't there? Oh, yes. We passed the day, uh, the first Earth Day. Uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin came in at her, uh, Speaker Feynman's request to be the main speaker, and that was the day we finally approved in the legislature the environmental amendment to the state constitution, and I had the honor of moving its adoption. And we did it, and we passed it, and we sent it on to the voters, and the voters gave it overwhelming approval. So. Um, there were natural and unnatural disasters that occurred during your tenure as representative and senator, such as the Johnstown flood of 77 and Three Mile Island in 79. Do you feel that the state has fulfilled its obligation to the people in regarding the Environmental Bill of Rights after these events? Well, I think the, peop the state of Pennsylvania has not done the job it asked to do on flooding, in particular flood control. Uh, in 1972, Hurricane Agnes struck, and that devastated the Susquehanna Valley. Uh, we lost millions and millions of dollars of damage, but lives were lost too. A couple of lives were lost in my in my house district, and so that one of my high school classmates was washed away in the flood, and uh, one or two were killed in Lewisburg, I believe, and here in Harrisburg. So when I got to the Senate, one of my big goals was to get a floodplain bill passed that would stop people from building into flood zones, and after six years, we did that. We passed a bill. We also passed a, uh, a stormwater management bill to get developers to hold water back. Now, the floodplain bill has worked reasonably well. That, what that says is people going into the floodplain, if, if you want to build, you can't build unless you get flood insurance. And to get flood insurance, the, the municipality has to zone it to keep you from building in a flood zone where there's a, hundred, where there's a chance of a 100-year flood. So that slows down people from building there. And... I think that has worked reasonably well. The stormwater bill has not been well enforced. It's, it's still lagging. And I think that the, 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 the state legislature and the state government should do, do a lot more to get people to stop building where there is a chance of a flood and to, for developers to hold back water when they turn a cornfield into a parking lot. They ought to be required to hold that water back and not just discharge in a flash flood because that makes it even worse. So I would say we've, we have not done what we need to do on floodplain and stormwater management. We, have a, we still have work to do there. In a statement on the House floor in 69, you said that the real capital of the nation and our state is its God-given natural resources. Mm -hmm. Thirty-five years later, do you, is that still a true statement? Oh, yes. Pennsylvania has a great deal of good, good natural resources. We have a great deal of, uh, of, our, of our streams are, are, are now much cleaner. We have a lot of forest and game land. I think we're doing a lot more with clean and green and 
pre uh, preserving scenic areas. We have a lot of wildlife area. We, we do, we've come a long way, and I still think that's true. But we still have a lot of damage to undo. Don't forget, for 100 years, from the Civil War till the 1960s, our natural resources were pretty well ravaged and exploited by the coal companies and the steel companies and the railroad companies. We're still paying a price for that, but I think we've come a long way. I think we've got to keep going. We've got to finish the job. Did your constituents have any influence on your debates um, regarding absentee voting legislation in 69? Oh, sure. In Northumberland County, one of the things the Lark organization did was perfect using the absentee to get votes that they, they were used to have the county sheriff go out to visit the county nursing home and bring back all the, uh, the absentee ballot applications. And they always came back straight Republican. Even when one of the Democratic candidates had an aunt living there, they came back straight Republican. So I knew there was, that wasn't being played according to the proper rules. So I teamed up with a representative uh, from uh, Lackawanna County who was Republican. I had the same thing up there. And we put together uh, uh, some absentee ballot legislation and to, to clean that up so that they, you couldn't have county officials carrying around the ballots or the applications. They had to do it by mail. As a freshman legislature, legislator in 1967, did you find it difficult to get your legislation passed? Well, in 60, first of all, I was in the minority party, so whether I was a, <laughs> a freshman or I'd been there three or four times, it would have been difficult. Uh, yeah, it was difficult, but I didn't have, we, were, we worked on clean streams legislation, but I knew when the Democrats won again in two years, we could do even better. Mm -hmm. So I put some bills in, but it, it, it was harder. But it wasn't because so much I was a freshman, it was because I was in a minority party and Republicans controlled. Okay. Uh, could you describe your career after leaving the House of Representatives? Well, in 1972, uh, the incumbent state senator, Preston Davis, announced that he was not going to run for re-election. And I knew that if I ever wanted to go to the Senate, that was my opportunity because it was an open seat. So uh, I ran for the Senate in 1972 and I won. And I went over to the Senate and served two terms there. And then in 1980, I decided I've done what I want to do in Harrisburg. It's time to go on to other things with my life. And I did. I left voluntarily. I retired. I went into law, returned to law practice and wound up as a partner in uh, Reed Smith, which is a law firm with offices in Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, or Philadelphia in those days, and uh, all around the country. So it was a big law firm, and I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing now? Now I'm retired from law practice and I'm working for Milady and Wooten, which is a government affairs firm here in Harrisburg where I advise and counsel and lobby for the firm's clients and my clients. Okay. Um, and you're still involved in environmental issues? Yeah, occasionally for clients. And, I, and I'm, I'm on the board of directors of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and I uh, uh, occasionally contribute to other environmental organizations, but uh, th th that's the extent of it. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, what your office was like as a representative whenever you were serving? Well, when I got to Harrisburg, I had no office. The only seat was my seat in the floor of the House. There were no offices, no secretaries. There was one phone which everybody could take turns using, and uh, that was it. Eventually, the next year, we got a secretary for 20 of us. And then when Herb Feynman became uh, the Democratic leader and then the speaker, he wanted to modernize. So he was the one that really led the revolution to get his offices and his secretaries. I wound up on the fifth floor of the Capitol my last year there. There were four of us in one office. And we had a secretary. And our, we each had our own phone. So it was a great improvement. But uh, uh, that was the... It, it, it took six years to get that, and we had no district offices. Now, fortunately, my wife and I practiced law in Sunbury, so we had a law office, and I, had, I was able to use that as a, as a district office uh, unofficially. Mm -hmm. so, but so, that was it. So things kind of improved the longer you served. Oh, yes. Yeah, when I lived in the Senate, we, I finally got district office. Mm -hmm. And I, had a major, and I was a committee chairman in, in, in the Senate, and I had a staff there of five or six people. So it was a lot different, a lot better. Awesome. But the house, and it was just me and my suitcase, or a briefcase when I got there. Okay. Um, how would you want your tenure as state representative to be remembered? Well, I'd, 
I like to be remembered as someone who proved that you can, do, you can be effective in politics if you get a lot of people in your district to get to work with you and first of all get you elected. I mean, you have to win. Mm -hmm. But you need to do that, you need to get a lot of people. You, politics is a team activity. You can't do it by yourself. I was blessed to have a lot of people help me, starting with my wife who knocked on a lot, as many doors as I did. And the Democratic women of Sunbury who addressed all those envelopes for me. And, and also some uh, labor organizations helped me at the steel plant, the steel workers union, and other. And I had a lot of people from different organizations that helped me, and I think you need to do that. But then I found I could be very effective if I worked realistically and with the leadership. So I'd like to remember somebody who came to town with the idea of trying to improve our, our laws dealing with the environment and succeeded. I feel very good about the role I played in uh, enacting a tough clean streams law. The Scenic Rivers Bill, and of course, first, most of all, is the Environmental Amendment to the State Constitution. That I feel very, 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 very proud of. So when my children asked me what I did when I was in the House, I'm going to hand them a copy of Article 1, Section 27. Uh, lastly, do you have any advice for new members? Well, yes. My advice is remember who sent you. You were elected, you're an agent, you're not a principal. That means you're there to speak for other people. That doesn't mean you have to be a, uh, uh, an automatic mouthpiece for anything, but it means you've got to have a decent respect for the people who elect you, and you have to represent them, and if you disagree with them, you've got to say why and be clear about it. And I think they'll respect you. I don't think the people respect, expect you to be, do everything you want. I never forget when I left, Somebody stopped me on the street and they said, well, Senator Curry, you know, I want to tell you something. I didn't always agree with you, but I respected you because you told me what you were thinking and I gave you some credit for that and I, and I respected that. And I think that's the most important thing I would tell new legislators. Have respect for who sent you here and if you disagree with them, tell them openly and candidly. Don't, don't do anything that isn't open and above board. Well, thank you very much. Okay. This concludes our interview. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to be here with okay. us. Okay. My pleasure.